Uh, our next speaker it was studying applied physics. Uh, what year was it? Um, started in 1974. 1974. And it, he came across a, a bulletin. Um, uh, and it was okay, called I'll the Atomic Bulletin. And basically what's written in there are the areas of engineering. Uh, if you work on them, you're contributing to a, a worse world. And you had nuclear energy, you had atomic uh, bombs. And as a physicist, uh, our next speaker wanted to choose something where he would contribute to good. So, um, and what's funny is there was a clock basically that shows you uh, when it's when it's almost doomsday and uh, it and it has a couple of minutes like five minutes before 12 means we're almost okay uh, but and in that time 1971 it, it was at two minutes before 12 which meant that the world could be in real danger and that was because of all the nuclear upcoming nuclear energy um, from that moment on he uh, discovered uh, renewable energy he went to talk with a professor who shared about, uh, about solar energy and uh, he went for an interview Which and the next it. day he started on his PhD on solar energy. And uh, the newspapers say that uh, when he gives a talk about solar energy, you will become a solar energy fan for life. Um, I think we have yeah. almost everything ready. Okay, yes, uh, it should and, work now. Uh, um. Please give a, a warm welcome to uh, Professor um, Wim Simke, yeah. who uh, has received the, knight, uh, uh, the honorary knight from the Dutch government on his contributions for uh, solar energy. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I have a, a question to start with. Who of you is Dutch? Okay. Um, you all know uh, VPRO, which is a broadcasting... Um, um, society um, and they had a um, one of the uh, most exciting um, I would say films about uh, renewables uh, six weeks ago the doorbraak van duurzaam uh, in VPRO tegenlicht and in that um, Michael Eckert was um, giving the same story but together with some other people and it makes uh, I think one of the best um, advertisements for renewables ever made, not just in the Netherlands, but worldwide. So please uh, go onto the internet and see that uh, if you haven't seen it yet. VPRO Tegenlicht. So um, I will build upon some of the um, things that uh, Mike touched upon uh, in his presentation, but also that were uh, discussed uh, later on in the Q&A session. Um, it will be kind of a, a crash course in photovoltaics, so fasten your seat belts. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but I have a lot to tell, uh, and this is this is because I think, well, you're all students, so uh, or many of you are students, you, you want to learn, you want some quantitative motivation also for your work, uh, in, in addition to the inspiration uh, that, of course, is an important uh, driver for this event as well. So I will take you through uh, uh, several topics uh, in a rather ordered way, things that I find um, spectacular, important, um, and interesting to know. Uh, first of all, uh, this has to do with my own motivation, but also with the context in which we develop the, uh, the technology about the energy transformation uh, or transition. I think transformation it may be a better word. Um, then I'd like to zoom into the uh, solar energy technology that Mike uh, um, discussed. Um, um, what do we have today uh, and what do we expect? And I will also touch upon the, let's say, the projections in terms of cost, and they are quite spectacular, I can tell you. Then we need to think beyond cost because we have been very successful in cost reduction. But it, it also means that we have to think about uh, integration of photovoltaics or solar energy into different dimensions. I will discuss that briefly. So let's first, um, well, this, this is uh, for um, those of you who are not very familiar with the technology. There's a lot of confusion about solar, many different forms of solar energy. I will discuss primarily uh, light in, electricity out, which we call photovoltaic conversion or uh, briefly stated PV uh, in, in jargon. Very elegant technology and also because of that elegance, um, it has potentially a very high efficiency. Nature makes it relatively simple, although that's, uh, that's really relative, to reach a very high efficiency because 
the photons, the, the light that comes in is a high quality energy source and it can be converted in basically everything, uh, but it can be converted efficiently into electricity particularly. I will show you where we are and, and uh, what we hope to achieve in the coming decades. So um, the drivers, this was the poster that I had in my student room not so far from here in Utrecht, um, uh, which was kind of the motivation uh, for me to, to move into renewables or in solar energy depletion of resources and in particular of fossil fuels those were the days that we talked about we run out of oil um, and perhaps also other uh, uh, fossil fuel but that's no longer an argument today i would say uh, on the contrary um, because sorry this is what we're facing today we have a carbon bubble we cannot even use the huge amount of fossil fuels that we have because we will run into big big problems so it's no longer depletion it's rather how can we avoid using all that we have um, and it takes uh, some time before people start to realize that this is the case and you know that uh, some people have stated you should you should s sell your shares you probably don't have shares but shares in uh, conventional energy companies because they're heavily overrated because they're based on the the reserves of fossil fuels uh, uh, and we know that they will not be able to use them so what is the value of those reserves so that that's another perspective this is what happened in uh, paris of course um, fighting climate change is not identical to introducing renewables on a large scale but we can be sure that if we introduce renewables it will be a very important contribution to fighting climate change and this is uh, this i found a, a real nice uh, example of how people team up literally uh, to uh, to move in that direction so that's i think uh, probably the most important argument today but there are more reasons of course energy dependence and especially in europe we don't like this dependence of uh, the import of natural gas from the Soviet, or from Soviet Union, from Russia. Um, so that's <laughs> that, that's a reason to at least partially generate your own energy or import energy from as many different parts of the world as possible. Solar energy can be applied literally everywhere on Earth, so it can be exported from many places on the world. So we will come into a completely new situation. I think. Uh, potentially much more stable in political terms uh, if it's well spread over the world. Of course, uh, the old dream of bringing electricity or energy to the one and a half billion people who don't have access to commercial energy in the world. Um, unfortunately, this argument has been um, uh, put a bit in the background. It, it's now overshadowed by climate change, but I think it's still a very important argument for renewables to generate um, energy and and Mike showed you the beautiful picture um, to generate energy for people who don't have uh, commercial energy today uh, and it can be done in a clean way uh, on top of that but there's still more of course improving air quality this morning we had a collection of air quality pictures uh, in another conference next door um, it's it's really amazing uh, how people suffer in big cities all over the world of course this does not directly relate uh, to introduction of uh, solar energy but in the long term uh, this is a problem that should be solved also and of course i think in many countries this is increasingly more important um, building this new energy system will be a huge challenge but also a huge opportunity in uh, using it as a, a key component of the new green economy so if we that's that's another reason to work hard because competition is huge um, if we are lazy here in Europe or in the United States, everything will come from Asia. If we do uh, a good job, we can share in this huge market growth that is expected over the next decades. And we can benefit from that in economic terms, welfare, jobs, etc. So, very important also. Now, um, I'm a physicist, so I like to, to look at the numbers. Um, this, is, this is our challenge, so to say. We, we use... Uh, as much as um, 18 or we yeah 18 terawatts continuous power worldwide all forms of energy uh, this translates into more than two kilowatt per person continuously 24 7 as we speak all of you or um, to to serve you 2.4 kilowatts is used worldwide so that's that's tremendous um, 
The final consumption is somewhat lower, so there are losses in between, of course, but still close to two kilowatts per person. And if we would like to cover that with uh, solar energy, solar power, and I, I think we should dare to think far beyond electricity only, as I will show you, I think photovoltaics, if we can do um, a good job, can be used to produce heat and to produce fuels if we like to have them. So we can eat ourselves into other forms of energy consumption. Um, and therefore, uh, at least as the dot on the horizon, uh, we should dare to think about covering the entire energy demand uh, of the world using solar. Just to give you a few numbers, uh, a feeling. Of course, the sun does not shine continuously, so we need more than the, uh, the power that we uh, consume in the form of fossil fuels. Let's say we, use rough, we need roughly 100 terawatt, uh, the number that Mike also mentioned which is about 400 times the installed capacity of today. That's, we need to grow, that's a big opportunity. Less than 1% of everything that we are going to use has been installed yet, so lots of room for innovation and for business development. And this is around a million square kilometer. And then people say, okay, that's a huge area. It's a smaller area, much smaller area than we use today for all our energy generation in the forms that it is used today. So it is indeed a huge area, but it's more compact, and people can hardly believe that, more compact than the system that we have today. That's the good news. There is no limitation in terms of the uh, area that is needed um, in contrast to intuition, perhaps. So this is, this is our challenge in a, in a simple picture. Um, until about 200 years ago, the world ran on solar in different forms. Um, uh, we happen to be here at this peak of uh, consumption uh, a few years ago, uh, people who said well, we, we, we believe in peak oil or peak coal or whatever, they were laughed at. Uh, I think it's going to happen. And even if you look at the shape, uh, it's asymmetric. So we have to go down much faster than we went up. And we have to go down in, in just a few decades' time where it was built up uh, in uh, a few hundred years' time. So a huge challenge, but it's basically going back to normal. The world has to run on renewable energy in the end. There is no alternative to that. So we have to back, and the, the sun is by far the biggest source. So uh, a world that runs largely on solar energy in many different forms, I think, is the future for uh, our planet. Now let's look at the building blocks. So uh, we discussed silicon technology. This is uh, what it looks like. It comes in modules, solar modules, that you can buy commercially at low cost at an efficiency over 20% uh, for some of the technologies. Those are pieces of art. They're close to perfect in terms of technology, and they're almost for free. In fact, it's comparable. If you, if you buy a flat panel display, it's almost for free. And if you realize the, the technology inside, you can hardly believe it. This is simple uh, compared to flat panel display. So it is going to be, it is in fact already almost for free. Thin films, indeed, they have a hard time entering the market. So rather than presenting themselves as a cheap alternative, I think the philosophy of the new technologies under development is rather to try to serve new markets that cannot be served by the conventional or commercial technologies today. This gives them a stepping stone or a, a niche to prove themselves, to build up volume, to build up experience, and then perhaps in the longer term they can enter the, let's say, the mainstream market where it's mainly about cost today. Uh, so don't give up on thin films. Uh, I think in the long term they will come, uh, but it's much more challenging than originally expected, not uh, only because it's difficult to bring thin films uh, to maturity, but because crystalline silicon technology has been so incredibly successful in improving uh, efficiency and reducing cost. And then there's a the technology not relevant for the Netherlands, uh, but in the total portfolio, I think it's an interesting lighthouse technology where the best solar cells uh, go to, the most efficient solar cells, concentrated technologies that follow the sun and that use a very small area device on which the light is uh, concentrated so that you can put the devices in there, the cells in there, the best you can buy for money, uh, basically. This is where cells with an efficiency close to 40% are used in the focus of the light. And the module efficiencies uh, that you can buy are uh, up to 35%. So uh, this is to complete the portfolio. This is what's going on in the lab. Um, 
all the record efficiencies over time. Don't look at the details. This is the trend. It's a robust increase in efficiency, and there is no reason whatsoever to expect that this will saturate in any foreseeable future. Um, there are so many uh, opportunities for further enhancement uh, that are in the labs, and an increasing number of scientists is working on that because they, they see this as very nice science, highly relevant science. You can even make nature and science papers in that field and still work uh, uh, to the benefit of society. There, there's no more beautiful field to a certain extent. This is what the, the efficiencies of the commercial modules over time have shown. Also here, we have this robust increase, and it's well, what I call blood, sweat, and tears, because it's um, turning all the knobs so that you have this very small improvement in efficiency at the same cost or at a lower cost, reducing materials consumption, having a higher throughput, increasing yield of the uh, processes. It's blood, sweat, and tears, but it works, as you see, and there's no stopping it. Um, this has been shown by Mike, so I, I can skip this. This is the, the, the growth of the market. This is the number, about 1.3% of all electricity, not energy, electricity is produced by solar today. So this is only the beginning, uh, uh, but um, I'm convinced that uh, we will see tremendous growth so that this will move from 1 to 10 and uh, hopefully much far further than 10% uh, in the foreseeable future. Prices of complete systems came down uh, dramatically in the last decade, roughly. This is uh, numbers from Germany. Here you see that um, in about 10 years' time, uh, the prices of complete systems, modules, but all the rest, including installation, came down by a factor of four. Um, and it's interesting to see that today, in an installation, half of the price or the cost is related to the modules, and the other half is related to all the rest. That's important to know if you want to uh, decrease the cost of solar energy further. Um, this is a, a big plant. I think it's in India. Uh, these are the numbers. Um, so the lowest cost solar electricity generated with an existing plant is somewhere around $5 cents per kilowatt hour. And there was a claim that for a plant that can be built over the next few years, uh, and for cheap capital, so low cost capital, uh, well, you don't get any interest rate on your money in the bank if you have any, uh, but uh, big companies um, also apparently um, um, are satisfied with lower profits as long as there is a low risk uh, at the same time. And this is proven technology, so uh, it comes with a warranty of 25 years in many cases. So this is one of the reasons why it does not have to generate huge uh, profits. Uh, it's a low risk investment and our pension funds uh, increasingly see that as well. Um, he's not here. Um, Michael Liebreich uh, from uh, Bloomberg, he was next door. This was a picture that he uh, put on the internet a year and a half ago. Um, so this is, we all worry about, we worried about the price development of fossil fuels. This is all marginal compared to what happened in the background, in the foreground for some of us, but in the background for many. Like a rocket, the prices of solar came down, and uh, you can imagine that this is an interesting crossing point uh, that uh, Mike Eckert also uh, touched upon. This is the driver behind. This is the so-called price experience curve. Um, in this, we find the combined effects of volume, economies of scale in all parts of the value chain, and innovation. If we would not do research and development um, at a very high level, this would not have such a steep slope. Um, it would be the Bruce Ford brute force method to, to get prices down. Uh, but the combination of volume on the one hand and innovation on the other hand has done the job, and I'm sure uh, that it will do the job in the, uh, in the future decades as well. So what do we expect? Um, for performance, efficiency of modules. This is um, what, what happened in the past. So I think over the next years, we will simply see further improvement of what we have. Um, this is not easy, but it's going to happen. But then we are basically at the fundamental limit for the type of modules that we have today. So we have to come up with something new. Well, this is what people think about. Let's, let's use what we have. Um, thin films and crystalline silicon and literally stack them on top of each other. 
it's easily said, not so easily done, but it's the obvious next uh, step in performance enhancement. So the top cell uses part of the solar spectrum, let's say simply said the, the blue part, and lets the red and the infrared go to the cell underneath, which then converts that part into electricity. The combination can be significantly more efficient uh, than uh, the, uh, the single cells. Fortunately, we have some time to make this a reality. It's not so simple. It's easy to make a silicon module worse. It's not so easy to make it better by stacking anything on top of it. So, and then there's, there's lots more coming. It's confusing to many people. So what should we believe? What, what comes at what time? Um, don't wait until those t technologies reach the market. They will only come into the market if you continue to buy what we have today because that drives the innovation, that drives the investments in new technologies. And then I'm confident that over time, new technologies will enter and will give you plenty more opportunities for applications. Efficiency is very important. This is the cost buildup of generation, uh, the generation cost of solar electricity. It's, of course, the hardware, so the modules and the uh, insulation materials, etc. There is also the operation and maintenance, you have to look at it. Sometimes in some areas you need to clean and you need to have the money, you have to, to pay interest, for instance. Well, this is a, just an exemplary thing. If we increase efficiency, all, things, uh, all other things the same, then this is what happens. All the cost components shrink. This is the lever for cost reduction. Therefore, uh, if everything else would remain the same and we would simply increase the efficiency, solar energy will be, would become much more cheap. So, um, I'll skip this. this the, our German friends made a prediction of what might happen with the uh, generation cost over time. They did a, a good job, but they're German, so they're quite I sh I, conservative to a certain extent. I would say um, this is kind of the lower limit of w what we can expect. It's a factor of three cost reduction compared to today. I showed you, and uh, there is a uh, generation between three and five cents today, so this answers the question. In the long term, I think we can come close to one cent per kilowatt hour uh, for solar electricity in sunny regions. This makes it possible to use that electricity, not only for, uh, as electricity, but also to convert it into fuels if we need fuels uh, and still have acceptable cost. That's the long-term perspective and the challenge. Not easy, uh, but I'm convinced it's going to happen. So solar fuels uh, produced using solar electricity. Um, well, there's of course, solar energy is renewable, but it's not automatically sustainable. We need to start, sorry, start thinking about design for sustainability. So far, it was about reliability. It was about performance. It was about cost. We have done a great job in improving all of that. Now it's time to start thinking about uh, a completely sustainable approach. Design the module and the other components for sustainability so that we can recycle them at the end of life. We avoid the use of scarce materials as much as possible. And if it can be not, uh, cannot be avoided, we should be make sure that the cycles, material cycles are entirely closed. That is uh, a big challenge, I think. Now, uh, we have to move beyond cost. Um, we have to integrate solar energy. I will give you a few examples. This is uh, an example from the Netherlands, uh, an integrated system in a roof. And another example, um, it's a World Heritage Area in the Netherlands. I don't think this is going to give us the gigawatts in the Netherlands we need. So we need to move to integrated photovoltaics if we want it to become big. Um, this may help, perhaps. Uh, PV modules may come not only as black modules, but also white modules. Half the performance, but if you need white for your building or for some other reason, it will be available and in other colors and in other shapes. So uh, you, we, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, for that to happen, we, need, we can look at the fashion industry. We have haute couture, very expensive, unwearable, and we have the bulk. Uh, but in fashion, the haute couture is kind of the example for uh, the other fashion. And uh, so we, we can try to bring up the standard modules of today, um, lower them, sorry, increase their uh, aesthetics and try to reduce the cost of the integrated system so that they become affordable and available for large scale use. We need to integrate in the 
in the energy system. Um, the war on the electricity grid, if you could tell it, is, it has started. It's not going to be an easy process. It's not going to be without victims. Uh, but we need to, to start thinking about it. Um, and uh, the same is true for the energy economy. Um, two days ago, there was a, a shareholder meeting of Shell, and a few people, um, well, they, they made a, a resolution, Shell needs only to invest in renewables. Well, 97% of the shareholders voted against. I'm convinced that if over the next years, this percentage will go down, and at least it will trigger uh, rethinking of renewables also within companies like Shell. So, um, I will skip this. Just um, the final slide. I think uh, we should avoid uh, this picture to become reality. We're slowly cooked and uh, at least in the West we, we're not really feeling the pain of climate change yet. Of course, you can show the, the, uh, where uh, Greenland, um, ice melting, etc. we don't really feel the pain, so we're not really uh, moving rapidly. Um, I think one solution to that is to create an offer in terms of energy generation uh, that the world cannot refuse. So we don't have to use it, but we want to use it, and that's why it's going to accelerate. Thank you. Thank you, Wim. Uh, we have time for three more questions. So if there's the sir in the back, raise first. Uh, I was thinking about your slide with the, uh, the comic with Russia and the natural gas imports to Europe. Yeah. Um, do you think that the solar PV market would be insulated from the same sort of thing? Like, for example, would the Netherlands be able to produce all the electricity they need through PV, or would they have to be importing? And then how would that work on a global scale, like with uh, protectionism yeah. and things like that? The, the, for the technology, you mean? Uh, more for the politics behind it. Like, imagine this, you don't have a very high solar intensity in the Netherlands, okay, yeah. so you'd have to import from yeah. somewhere. How do you deal with that from protectionism? I, well, th that was a, one of the points I, I, I tried to touch upon. I think uh, solar energy uh, can be generated and it will be generated in many different parts of the world. So there is not such a thing as oil coming from one particular area or gas coming from one country. It comes from many different countries. So uh, the dependence or the risk um, does not hurt uh, as much. And, and I think in the end, we will not be uh, energy autonomous as a country. Uh, we will be importing and perhaps exporting uh, energy, but then renewable energy in different forms, electricity, fuels, etc. But it will come from many more uh, regions and it will go to many more regions than it is today. We have another question over here. Uh, I wonder how, you, uh, how we could store that energy and well, maybe use them in cars and such uh, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the, I, of course, the, the battery that I showed, the Tesla thing is, is a kind of an example, small scale storage that we may see. And I'm convinced that batteries will improve in a, a way that is perhaps not as spectacular as photovoltaics, but very, very much. But um, in the long term, I think conversion of electricity into uh, fuels or products is, is key to the uh, transition in the, in the long term. That's why I mentioned the very low generation cost and the possibility to use that to generate um, um, fuels. Take CO2 out of the air, combine it with hydrogen, and uh, use it and you can put the CO2 back into the ground if you want to have this 1.5 degrees because we need negative emissions probably to reach that. Final question? Yep. Hi. Um, I'm curious what is the true solar panel efficiency? Let's say you need an energy to produce the solar panel. You need the uh, energy to harvest the heavy metals. You need to manufacture. So yeah. you have on the left side of our uh, equation energy needed yeah, yeah. and then what it produces. Yes, what yes. is the true efficiency? Yeah. So um, uh, if, we, if we look at complete systems um, and we take the, the lifetime of the system to be 25 years, for instance, then the energy payback time um, is roughly between one and a half and two and a half years, depending on where you are in Europe. Uh, so let's say five to 10% of the energy output uh, is needed to build it in the, in, in the beginning. And then if that energy 
at the start in the production is renewable energy, um, it is no problem, you could say, because we have kind of a solar breeder concept uh, then. Um, that's not the case today. So uh, there is also a lot of coal-fired power used. But even in that case, uh, the uh, carbon footprint of PV is relatively small compared to all the other uh, energy sources that we have. But it's, and it's increasing over time. Uh, and I think in the end, the energy payback time will be less than a half a year. Final applause to Wim. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, one of the questions was about uh, ch solar for charging stations. And uh, that's what the next presentation is going to be. Thank you very much. We have also a small gift for Wim. Thank you. It's coming your way.